we have the first keynote speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Sören Albu from the University of Leipzig. He was actually one of the guys that created the first real bubble in the Lincoln Open dataset. And the first real bubble in the Lincoln dataset is one well, of the guys which was at the school the last few days. Which one? DBpedia, correct. So he actually did DBpedia, which is a copy of Wikipedia, but with triple information. That means using RDF technology. And now Cern will give us a keynote uh, until the break and explaining basically the emerging web of linked data. So a lot of pleasure with this keynote. Спасибо большое, Даня. И спасибо большое, что пригласили меня. Мне очень приятно быть здесь в Санкт-Петербурге. И, по-моему, это очень важно, что есть здесь такая конференция в Санкт-Петербурге. Я немножко понимаю русский язык. Вы можете мне задавать вопросы на русском языке тоже. Только говорить по семантичной паутина не будет трудно на русском языке. Поэтому даже на немецком языке трудно мне, поэтому я перевожу uh, сейчас на английский язык. So uh, the topic of the talk is to give you a little bit overview what's got, what's happening in this um, linked data web and what are research challenges, what are we currently working on, what's interesting um, maybe to look into in the next years, what are potential applications also, and that's what I would like to talk a little bit um, in the next hour. And the uh, first picture I want to show you is this one. Uh, so what do you think, uh, why am I showing this picture? Or actually I created this picture by searching on Google image search. Um, what do you think I was entering as a search query keyword uh, to Google image search? Any, any ideas? You have an idea? Wikipedia. No, it's not the Wikipedia. Not Wikipedia. Other ideas? What were the keywords where these pictures come up? So what you see here is like gardens, right? And you also see those gardens have walls or some kind of, of uh, portals. And uh, that's, that's actually what I searched for, walled gardens. Because I think that's a little bit how the current web looks like. We have lots of nice gardens, but they are in a way walled and they have fences around each other. You cannot really easily uh, get data from one uh, garden in the web to another one. And uh, I think that's something uh, what we try to address a little bit with this web of data, that we can actually build bridges between those gardens or remove the fences and the walls between them so you can easier wander around on the web from one uh, application from one system to another and exchange also data more easily. So, and this actually happens already. Um, so, publishing data and connecting linking data on the web this started um, like five, six years ago. And what you see here is basically this evolution of different data sets which are published on the web uh, and linked to each other. And uh, this grew pretty dramatically in the last years. Meanwhile, I think we reached the stage where it doesn't even fit on the on the map anymore. And we have a large data space. So that's uh, even a picture here from 2010. It's meanwhile quite outdated. And this uh, way of drawing pictures of, of something appearing on the internet reminds me a lot of the early days of the web. Uh, in the early 90s, also everybody was drawing maps of web servers and websites. Nowadays, nobody does that anymore. I think we currently also reach that stage where for the web of data, you cannot really draw these kind of maps anymore. But it shows that there is a huge amount of data out there. There are actually 50 billion facts available which can be used uh, uh, pieces of information which are um, readily usable, which are partially connected and interlinked. Um, and that's, I think, a quite, quite interesting resource. And of course, our idea is not only having all these data out there, but also tools which do something with the data and which support the life cycle of data from extraction um, over linking, fusing, classification, and enrichment. And that's a little bit uh, um, 
the outline of my talk, I would like to give you a little bit an idea of each of those life cycle stages, ranging from extraction over storage and querying, uh, manual revision and authoring. We also want to make the web, of course, a read-write web, not only a read web, but that you also can write and, and uh, publish information easily, the data web, linking, um, analyzing the quality, supporting the evolution repair of data, and last but not least, supporting the exploration, browsing, and enrichment. And that's also a little bit um, the conceptual model we use in the LOD2 project. That's a, a relatively large project where we are right now in the middle. We completed the first two years, and there are another two years ahead of us, um, where we try to develop some approaches for these um, supporting this life cycle of data on the web. So the first stage um, is extraction, and maybe in the previous um, years that was the most important one, to extract or get data on the data web, to uh, extract it from other sources, transform it, make it available, and there are basically three main categories. You can extract information from unstructured sources, um, and there is a large variety of NLP technologies out there, text mining, annotation of text, uh, which can be deployed and be used on the web of data. We also have semi-structured sources, so DBpedia, for example, uh, is extracted from Wikipedia, and they are from semi-structured elements. Um, I will show you a small example how that works. And there are other, lots of other semi-structured sources, like OpenStreetMap, for example. I was talking about that in the lecture on Friday. Um, or statistical data from uh, which can be represented in data cubes uh, and published on the data web. And then as a last category, we have structured information from relational databases. And um, there are, of course, lots of them, relational databases. And uh, we also need to connect them to the, to the web of data and make this information available. So with regard to semi-structured data, I want to briefly show you um, uh, how dbpedia works and, and what this is about. So what we try to do with dbpedia is to extract information from Wikipedia and make this available uh, as linked open data so that you can ask sophisticated queries against Wikipedia. For example, you can search for all universities in Russia or in a specific region or mayors of elevated towns, or soccer players which have a certain trico number and play in a stadium which has more than 10,000 seats, and such kinds of queries uh, you can run. You can link it, of course, to lots of other data sets, and in a way, um, this represents also community consensus because there is a lot of work being done by the Wikipedia community in curating the data or the identifiers that can be uh, tapped by, by um, applications on the web of data. So how does that work? If you look at the Wikipedia page, you have different uh, elements there, like the title, for example, or we have those geo-coordinates, uh, we have disambiguations and redirects, uh, the richest source of information are those fact boxes, which are usually appear on the right-hand side in a small table, and uh, many other sources like links to other language versions, um, to categories, and so on and so forth. And that's what we extract from Wikipedia and make this available as RDF and, and link data as a Sparkle endpoint. Um, and here's uh, the example of such an info box, how this is transformed into um, uh, triples, into RDF triples and facts. Uh, so we basically take this wiki source code and there you already have this attribute value notation. Uh, they are separated by, uh, by this equal sign here. And then uh, you can prepend that uh, with a resource in that case, Busan, it's a city in South Korea, where we, I presented the first Wikipedia or DBpedia um, extraction thing in 2008 or 2007. Um, and um, you basically then uh, create properties for those attributes and values for uh, objects for the values of the attributes. And then you can generate those triples. And what was very interesting uh, when we did this first extraction that it's actually a connected graph. So it's not disconnected. What you see here, for example, is that uh, this info box about the city of Busan is connected to the region and to the dialect. 
and from, uh, from that you can create RDF links to this instance of the region and of the dialect. And there are again uh, info boxes where you can extract information. So in the end you really have a connected graph of information spanning across different types of, of data and data items. Um, you also see a little bit the problems which we have here. What do you think the problem is? The people who attended the lecture on Friday know this already. How you do the ontology? Sorry? How you do the ontology when you describe this? Exactly, how the ontology is built or you also see here that those attributes, they of course are not very clean. Here for example we have pop for population and um, it should be mapped to an ontology because uh, these attributes here, they are not standardized. So, of course, in that info box, it will be always pop, but there are lots of info boxes uh, or types of info boxes talking about cities. And there, you don't have a unique scheme of, of representing those attributes. And uh, that's why we have to map, for example, population. There are 20 different variations how population is expressed in different info boxes. Sometimes it's pop, sometimes it's population, sometimes number of inhabitants sometimes just inhabitants and that uh, of course makes the data a little bit messy and we now try to clean this up also using a crowdsourcing approach uh, using a mappings wiki where basically everybody can establish those mappings and configure the extraction of from uh, from Wikipedia so uh, as an outcome you have um, more than one billion pieces of information. Uh, you have a large number of different domains covered from people over places, music albums, movies, video games, organizations, and so on and so forth. Um, that's why I think Wikipedia is quite interesting because you can connect it to many different data sets, or actually almost every data set can connect to Wikipedia because it reflects some or contains some information which you also um, uh, um, which are connected to this particular domain. And um, we also have this uh, live endpoint, which basically reflects the current stage. So if you update something in Wikipedia, it will be also immediately available on this uh, live endpoint. Um, and the mappings wiki, which I mentioned, is the one where we uh, try to clean up um, DBpedia in the sense that um, um, that the community can basically configure this extraction, give hints how to parse certain types of data, how to transform it and extract it. And hopefully in the next uh, months we will um, uh, have see some significant improvements. But of course also um, um, there is another project which started recently, uh, the Wikidata project, which tries to achieve something very similar. Um, their approach actually is a little bit the opposite. They don't extract information from Wikipedia, but they want to inject structured data into Wikipedia. So uh, they want to, um, or it's not they, I'm also part of this uh, endeavor actually. I'm a member of the advisory board and there are some key members of DBpedia, also members of Wikidata, Anja Jens, for example, which contributed a lot to uh, DBpedia, is now working for Wikidata. There the idea is that those info boxes are generated from structured data in the first place. And that's of course the nicer and cleaner solution and hopefully uh, this will soon be successfully deployed on, on Wikipedia and then maybe some parts which we do right now in uh, Wikipedia will become obsolete. Of course there are many other things uh, which won't become obsolete by Wikidata and where they still um, need basically this infrastructure. The ontology can be also very helpful which we uh, created. Uh, what we actually are working on now is also having something in inline mode where you, in the text of a wiki article, can add semantic annotations. Um, and uh, that's something which is currently in the works, which will take, of course, some time uh, to get this uh, deployed. And, um, and we start, want to start with small Wikipedia editions like the Greek one or the Dutch one, uh, because there it's a little easier to experiment. Uh, with this, with such new features. So as a result, you can query the DPPDA Sparkle endpoint and you will get uh, results um, as, um, for example, like a table or relation and then you can do something with it, um, integrate it, create mesh hubs, integrate it with other data, um, 
use that in other applications. So here's an example where uh, which queries for uh, musicians uh, which have as birthplace Berlin and if you want to get the birth date and a short description from DBP. Okay, um, so that's an example of Wikipedia, how um, semi-structured information is extracted and represented on the web now, in, uh, especially when we look at enterprises, but also web applications. They often use relational databases as backends, and the vast majority of data is stored in relational databases. And I think it's quite naive to assume that we would be able to replace that by triple stores. That's not what we want to. Um, uh, if data is well stored in a relational database, it could, should be kept there. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to map this relational data to RDF. And that's another extraction mapping challenge, how this can be done. There is a W3C working group on that issue, uh, the RDB to RDF working group, uh, which just um, like a few weeks ago published a standard or a recommendation which is called the RML, R to RML standard how you can map, it's a mapping language, defines a mapping language, how a relational database can be mapped into RDF. Um, but still, I think there is a lot of improvement. For example, this R to RML is just one directional. You can publish relational data as RDF, uh, but you cannot update uh, the relational data via Sparkle update, for example, or via adding, deleting triples. So this uh, bidirectional way uh, doesn't work also Reasoning features or inferencing, for example, are not supported yet. So I think there is a large area where the standard can be improved or taken to the can be taken to the next level. Um, and um, also the semantics, uh, it's more uh, defines the syntax of the mapping language, but uh, the semantics is not so clearly defined. And there's still discussions going on with different approaches and um, things. Um, we developed two. Uh, applications or two tools for mapping relational data to RDF. One is Triplify and another one Spark the Map. And then there are of course a large number of others as well. D2R, uh, maybe the first one which appeared uh, more than almost 10 years ago, um, which was developed by Chris Pitzer and Richard Zuganiak, um, and which is uh, of course like a, a standard tool there. But D2R doesn't accomplish some something which we try to accomplish with Sparkle Map, that's translating one Sparkle query into exactly one SQL query, so that you can efficiently push the workload down into the relational database. So Triplify, the simplistic approach, used um, SQL as a mapping language. Um, so we didn't define a new mapping language, but we reused basically SQL and defined certain some conventions on top of uh, SQL select queries, which you should uh, have, should obey to, and then the results of your select queries could be easily transformed into RDF. That's how uh, Triplify worked. It's a very lightweight approach, and the idea was also that this should be integrated into web applications, um, which are deployed hundreds or thousand times on the web, like blogs, uh, wikis, and uh, content management systems. And now uh, with SparkQL Map, we extended the approach and uh, try to support also Sparkle Query so that you translate Sparkle Queries directly into corresponding SQL Queries. And that's a little bit what's depicted here. On this figure, what you see there, uh, we have a relational database um, and we want to query this relational database using SparkQL. What the RUML standard defines is basically how uh, from a relational database, we can generate triples, but it doesn't define how a Sparkle query should be translated uh, into a corresponding SQL query. So that's the, the lower part. Uh, but of course, in the end, both should be um, should render the same result. Whether you translate the whole database into triples first, load all these triples into a triple store, and then query it via Sparkle should render exactly the same result as if when you uh, translate the Sparkle query directly into an SQL query and transform the results of the SQL query back into, um, um, into RDF. So these two paths basically should uh, render the same results. And that's, um, that's what the Sparkle map tries to accomplish, is basically this lower part 
that you don't need to extract triples from the triple store, but you can um, uh, view your triple store as a virtual Spark URL endpoint. Then, um, besides structured information, we also have a lot of unstructured or information in, um, especially also, for example, enterprise intranets. And how can we deal with unstructured information? How can we make this um, accessible um, and link this um, to other data sets, interconnect that, relate that to data on the data web? And one approach um, uh, we developed here with my colleague Sebastian Elman is um, the NLP interchange format, uh, which aims at exactly connecting um, unstructured texts, basically, with linked data. And here's a brief overview how this works. So it consists of three parts. Uh, the NIF NLP interchange format. Um, the first part is structural interoperability, uh, which defines uh, a URI scheme, how you can address parts of a text, basically. How um, individual items in the text can be, can be addressed. Maybe I'll show you an example how this works. Uh, here we see uh, there are two schemes basically. Uh, the first one is a very, very simple one. Probably each one of you would have come up with this solution. You basically uh, define the offset. You say at what character index a certain part of the text starts and where it ends. Yeah? So in that case it starts with character 14,406 and continues to 14,480. Um, and then you have a human readable representation, in that case here it's a semantic web. Uh, we actually look at this document, design issues, link data from Tim Berners-Lee, and obviously at this character position the term semantic web appears. And then you can append uh, this string here uh, behind the hash code, and then you basically this way can address um, this particular term here, semantic web, and address this part of the text in, in a larger text. And then make any, um, um, any statements about that, and that's what you see here, basically we say this means, so it's a link to dbpedia then, to semantic web, and we have a comment, um, yeah, Tim was a good idea, semantic web, so somebody attached a comment, you basically can refer to a, really parts of a text, of a larger text, and uh, identify them. So, this is the simple solution, where, which every, don't know, bachelor student would easily can, have come up with. Uh, it has some disadvantage. What's the main disadvantage of that? Any idea? The first addressing scheme. If you change something before 14, the 14,406 character, right? You add a word in the beginning, right? Then all your identifiers will break after the identifiers identifying parts of the text afterwards. So it's not a very stable solution. If Tim updates his, his uh, design issues document, which is at this URL, if he only adds one character somewhere in the beginning, right? All the URIs would break basically uh, because all the offset indexes would change. So that's why this is not a very stable, a good solution for text which might potentially change, right? And that's why we developed the second solution here, uh, which is um, basically computing a hash code. Uh, so what we do here, we define the context length. In that case, uh, it's 12 characters. I think that's exactly the length of semantic web. I ah, know the context length, sorry, is the first, is four. Uh, we add a context around semantic web, before and after semantic web, so that's four characters. Then we have the string length, which is 12 characters, that's the length of uh, semantic web. And then we have an MD5 hash of the context plus the string. So we take four characters before semantic web, semantic web, four characters afterwards, and this resulting string, which has how many characters? How many? 20, exactly. 4 plus 12 plus 4, 20 characters. So we compute the hash uh, of this, and that's exactly what this uh, MD5 hash is right here. And then we also have a readable representation of it. Uh, this way, uh, we are not um, bound to the offset anymore, and that way we can address 
part of the text uh, without making a precise reference to a certain index position. Um, of course, you have to select this context in a way that it's unique. It could be that um, the 20 characters we identified appear several times in the text, right? So you have to make sure that you select the context which is large enough so that your identifier becomes really unique. Otherwise, you will address several um, several occurrences of semantic web at once. If you select, for example, context zero, which means no characters in front or afterwards, then you would basically address all occurrences of semantic web in the text. Yeah? And depending on how you select the context, you can make this unique. And um, even if somebody changes something in front or afterwards, it doesn't break, uh, it doesn't break your, your uh, identifiers. Only if something in the context um, is changed. Yeah? So these URIs are much more stable and you do the same, you append this basically to this prefix or to the base URI you have here and this way you have a, a way um, to identify also parts of the text and then you can add annotations. You can say this is a noun, this is a named entity, this is a relationship um, and so on and so forth and can use all the uh, NLP annotations, all the NLP tools, and that's uh, one of the basic concepts of this NIF uh, to address parts of the text and then uh, represent annotations according to ontologies. There are a number of ontologies like Olia, Nerd, uh, Topic, Opinion, Sentiment ontologies. There are lots of language resources like Paula, Wiktionary, Lemon, WordNet, Wikipedia, and so on and so forth. And you can then annotate. Uh, the occurrences or the output of NLP tools using these ontologies. And then on the access interoperability layer, um, you use triple scores, REST interfaces, in order to um, uh, access this information. And that allows you to loosely couple different um, NLP services. I think previously we also had very very good NLP frameworks, there were Skate, there is uh, UEMA from IBM, um, there is Ontos, for example, also develops an uh, NLP framework, but they are in a way monolithic. They are not so well connected to other resources, to other ontologies. Often they are also good in one particular thing. Um, they are good in an entity recognition or part of speech tagging, <coughs> but maybe not so good in other aspects. Yeah? When you com want to combine different tools with different strengths, um, then you could use the sniff approach that one tool outputs sniff and another tool consumes uh, the sniff output as an input and does something on top of it. For example, for an entity recognition, you need part, part of speech tagging. Um, and uh, if uh, a tool doing part of speech tagging outputs sniff, then other tools can consume that. And you can actually also try lots of different tools and see which one can create the best results for a particular language. Um, or for a particular application domain and um, this way that's a little more standardized approach of uh, connecting different distributed tools, potentially distributed tools um, using NLP and, and link data technology. Okay, um, then there are those linguistic resources. So what I show you here is uh, the linguistic link data cloud, the number of uh, resources which were created of supporting this NLP extraction annotation process. Um, and there is a quite vibrant community working on enhancing and increasing the amount of data available there. I would like to show you one particular example. Uh, that's the dictionary ex extraction. Who of you has heard of Wiktionary? Uh, few people. So Wiktionary basically is something like WordNet or a resource defining words and sentences in different languages, very multilingual. So it also there is Russian, German, uh, Spanish, Japanese, Korean, uh, Wiktionary. It's part of Wikipedia or, or uh, Wikipedia, sorry, uh, the Wikipedia, one particular Wikipedia project. Uh, but uh, targeting, uh, representing information, linguistic information about words and uh, senses and uh, different word types. It's growing very actively and there are a large number of contributors. It's openly licensed so you can really reuse that uh, in whatever way you want, even for commercial applications. Um, 
and uh, it has this crowdsourcing approach, so it improves, improves over time quite a lot. And what we do there is something similar as a BBP, where we extract information uh, from dictionary, but uh, of course here the structure of the information in the uh, wiki pages is quite different. So here it's more interpreting the headings, the different headings, and then uh, the, the lists of things which appear in these headings. So each page in dictionary has a title, and there are different languages. Basically the title of the page refers to a particular word. And then we have uh, this word can appear in different languages. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so there, um, I wanted to mention Duksak, uh, which is a Russian word, of course, but also German word. Uh, this would be different pages because Cyrillic uh, spelling, of course, is different from, from the uh, spelling in Latin. But there are similar examples um, where you have one word which appears in, in different languages. Um, and uh, these would be part of the page. And then you have different parts of speech uh, because one word can sometimes be a noun, it can be an adjective at the same time, or not at the same time, but the same word can appear as a noun or as an adjective, adjective or in different um, um, types of part of speech. And then you have different senses. Um, again, uh, each part of speech could so be associated with different senses. And that's basically how we uh, interpret those dictionary pages and extract information from the dictionary pages. The problem is, uh, in each different dictionary um, language edition, those headings are of course localized. In English we have pronunciation and adjective. Uh, in German uh, it would be German headings and in the Russian version you have the Russian headings. So you basically have to adapt the extraction to each particular language version and make it aware of the, of the language. What we also do is we map this to the, um, to the Lemon um, ontology or vocabulary which was uh, created for representing such kind of information um, and then uh, basically make this available in RDF and, uh, as a Sparkle endpoint for download and that's what we see here um, so uh, you can download this information or access this information in English, French in Russian and German, and as you see here, Russian, for example, is, um, is very well developed compared to German, much bigger, the Russian dictionary, than uh, the German one, and is, uh, that's why we can also extract more information from, from the Russian dictionary. The uh, English one is not even the largest, so in French, um, the French one is here even better developed than the English one. So and I think this is a quite interesting resource for NLP approaches using that as background knowledge where you have this large crowdsourced uh, background knowledge representing information about different words, about senses um, um, and um, using that as background knowledge and you can, uh, there is the Open Knowledge Foundation working group on linguistics, there is also W3C working group on multilingual web and those two groups basically are driving a little bit this, um, this effort around uh, having a linguistic link data web. Okay, there are a number of opportunities also using this in enterprises, so um, tapping this wealth of knowledge. If you wanted to create something like DBpedia or Wiktionary yourself, it would cost you a lot of money. Um, basically on the web of data you get all this information for free and you can build applications on top of it, use that in your algorithms and tools and that's a quite big opportunity also for enterprises to tap and exploit this uh, knowledge. Um, and then of course RDF uh, can be also used in enterprises as a data model, as a lingua franca for data integration, enterprise data integration. Uh, so these are opportunities with regard to the information extraction and now I would like to go to the uh, second aspect. We were now looking at the first one. The other ones are much shorter than the first one, so uh, don't be scared. Um, the next one is storage and query. Here I actually only have two slides, 
because um, we don't work that much in the area. So once you've created all these RDF, um, you of course also have to store that and manage that somewhere. And there is RDF data management. Triple stores are available uh, to do that. Meanwhile, there is a large number of different triple stores uh, from different vendors or communities, open source communities. Some of them are commercial, some of them are open source, some are uh, run in a distributed environment or a cluster, some run in main memory, so they have quite different characteristics for different features, similar as you have different variety of different relational database systems. And um, of course they are still slower, so if you have data which you can fit into a relational database, then it's always better to use a relational database and use something like Spark or Map maybe to connect it to the web of data. Um, but uh, that's not always possible. For example, with DPP or with Wiktionary, this could not, would not fit into a relational database. So there you need a triple score, and then you still have to pay a, a penalty. Um, I have here on this slide 5 to 50 times slower. I think it's meanwhile already a little bit less, maybe 3 to 10 times slower. Um, and I think in the next two years, we are actually working very intensively together with a um, research institute in the Netherlands, CWI, and the company OpenLink, and many other, to improve that steadily. And we are quite optimistic that in the next two, three years, uh, there won't be any penalty there, and uh, more between using RDF data management and relational data management. Of course, you also have a lot of benefits. You gain much more flexibility if you want to change the structure of your relational database, it costs you much, much more, actually, uh, maybe a million times more than changing the structure of your ontology or of your schema. If you add a class to an ontology schema, it's adding one triple or several triples. So the cost of uh, changing your schema in RDF is the same cost as adding data. While in a relational database, uh, the cost of changing the schema is thousands if not million times higher than the cost of adding data. So that's the big advantage and the good news with RDF and uh, that's what, uh, what makes triple stores still a very viable and interesting option uh, to be used uh, for RDF data or for applications as well. Um, and as I said, we are working on reducing this performance gap between relational and RDF data management. I think there are also a number of opportunities to extend Sparkle, the query in the language, uh, with regard to spatial or temporal um, uh, operators, which are not very well supported right now. Um, improving, for example, also the query result caching or reorganize the information based on common access patterns. When you see that people access the information in certain ways, you can prepare uh, the storage layout this way that it's uh, uh, performing better. And uh, you can leverage triple stores, for example, in enterprises to uh, use um, them for hosting thesauri, which are already quite common. Large companies, they often have a thesaurus of where they define the language, the concepts, the words used in their enterprise. And I think triple stores are quite well suited for uh, hosting such kind of data. Now, with regard to authoring, how can we author information on the um, data web? And I want to show you an example uh, from uh, semantic wikis. Uh, so there are two kinds of semantic wikis. Text wikis, where you basically annotate text. And uh, another type of wiki are data wikis, where we really work with data, structured data, and uh, enter information in a form-based approach. And I would like to uh, show you some examples from uh, the wiki we develop in Leipzig, which is called OntoWiki, which is such a data wiki, which is open source. Um, it's actually not only a wiki, but a whole infrastructure for um, linked data applications, Sparkle endpoint. There's also Timofe Amilov here in the auditorium, who is one of the contributors of OntoWiki and the team in Leipzig working on improving OntoWiki. It's open source, so can, you can use it uh, without having to buy a license. Um, there's meanwhile a relatively large community of users. We also have companies using that. Uh, for example, um, Deutsche Telekom for the European Commission, we adopted that recently. Um, and several other companies. And one use case I want to present you is from the area um, from a car manufacturer. 
um, where we deployed onto Wiki for integrating different um, types or two information sources basically. One is the car model database. Um, um, I guess you can see here a little bit what car manufacturer that is. Um, it's Mercedes um, Daimler and they have a car model database where they have all their models in there. Um, and um, the problem is that they have some, uh, in their company, they have a corporate slang or language. For example, they don't use the term hatchback or combi, uh, which is um, the common words for a car having uh, like the combi shape. But the term they use internally is T-model. Right? So uh, when, always when they talk about the hatchback uh, car, in Daimler, they, they use the word T-model. Everybody in Daimler knows what it is, but nobody outside of Daimler. And that's, of course, uh, a problem. So if you search uh, for Combi, you would not find easily information. Of course, they, can, they know that uh, they can translate that, but that's quite time consuming actually establishing these relationships. Although they have also an information source which contains this information, that's their thesaurus, where they have 50,000 concepts defined. They have translated that in lots of different languages, also in Russian, by the way, uh, because everywhere where they are in the market and sell uh, cars or have development teams or factories, they of course need all their concepts translated into those local languages. And uh, that's what they, what they did. And, uh, but still it was quite difficult and time-consuming uh, connecting this information. And that's what we tried to accomplish with OntoWiki. So what you see here is the car model uh, knowledge base, which we imported. It's actually a, a large Excel sheet, uh, which we imported into OntoWiki. Here you have the attributes or the different characteristics of a certain model. Uh, how, what's the fuel consumption, how many seats it has, and so on and so forth. Um, you can then query this by Sparkle, which is not what they really wanted. Um, but um, then they had this uh, taxonomy, this enterprise taxonomy, with thousands of, uh, or 500,000 of concepts, where they define all these uh, different um, terms and the language they use uh, internally. There is even an own department of, don't know, dozens of people who work on improving this thesaurus. And uh, refining that. And also this we basically loaded into OntoWiki and integrated that. We created a very simplified user interface and here you see for example Kyrillic version of um, a class, uh, one type of car they produce and then they also have the uh, term Kyrillic for example as different SCOS labels and that's the user interface which we created for them to easily update this information and, um, uh, work with that uh, large vocabulary and ontology. And finally, as a prototype or proof of concept, uh, we integrated that into their website where you can now search for copy and you easily find also T-model and you find different kinds of those T-models uh, and then you can actually have a preview. You can also add, uh, since we have this information now in a structured representation, you can query it in a structured way. For example, you are interested in cars which have more than six seats. Um, you can basically enter that into the search box um, and you get only those models which have more than six seats. Or you search for low fuel consumption below five liters, you actually get five models as well uh, which have less than five liters fuel consumption. And um, this was relatively easy after we connected those two data sources, the taxonomy and the car model database, building this search interface was extremely simple and, and easy. Um, having done this uh, in a traditional or with the old technology, of course it also would have been possible, but it would be much more time consuming. And also using that now in different contexts uh, simplifies it much more because uh, you can easily identify particular entities like a, a certain model. Each one has its URI and you can precisely identify it. So um, the idea is to have something like this. This is of course just a small example and you probably need in a large enterprise thousands or hundreds of these examples in order to make um, the intranet of an enterprise and, and, uh, and data intranet and that's uh, a little bit the vision we have and also the people, some people at Daimler from the IT department have 
uh, to integrate some of the, their 3,000 information systems. They have 3,000 uh, databases, different information systems, SAPs, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and only few of them are actually connected. Maybe a few hundred, 200, 300 of them are really connected. So the vast majority of their IT systems are not connected. And um, exploiting the data paradigm and, and connecting those things making them more interoperable has a huge potential, I think, in the future. Also because in large enterprises you have the same situation on the web. They will, will never agree on one um, enterprise data model or one big ontology. You have different departments, they fight against each other, they don't like each other, but still sometimes they have to cooperate. And uh, with linked data they can establish links between their data where they think it's useful and appropriate but they don't have to agree on everything and, um, and that's I think something which was very attractive uh, to them and they are now quite interested to build more of these pro proof of concepts and integrate them step by step in their um, backend systems and um, infrastructure. Also that you have a pay-as-you-go strategy, you don't have to roll out a new technology everywhere but you can go small steps, integrate two or three sources, use some vocabularies and then increase that uh, as you go and uh, the more you, you need information to re represent it uh, semantically. So here's an overview of how this could look like later on. Uh, so uh, on this um, company internal IT landscape, you have certain systems like uh, supply chain management and customer relationship management. They are of course already connected, right? So the mission critical uh, systems, they are connected in the enterprises, but uh, there are lots of systems like what we just saw, search, also the HR departments, lots of information sources which are not well connected. And that's what we want to achieve. And one um, point of uh, entry could be those taxonomies or enterprise knowledge bases uh, where you already have something. It's a little bit like what we did with DPP here for the web of data. That's their enterprise taxonomy for their company's <coughs> internal uh, data because there they have defined all different concepts and terms and uh, you can establish lots of links and relationships uh, to add some other of those uh, IT systems like different portals, different wikis they use or different domain databases and can use this enterprise knowledge base as some kind of uh, enterprise data hub, linking hub for different information assets in the enterprise. And another opportunity of course is to use this wealth of information on the linked data web uh, internally in the company, make use of uh, DBpedia or other data sets. Something interesting for example is uh, linked geodata or open street maps where you have very precise spatial information which you can use and uh, there are a number of um, quite interesting relevant data sets there. Okay, another important aspect is um, linking. How can we link information, sorry? Um, and that's um, actually something which is uh, quite important since only relatively small part of the information is still linked on the data web. Uh, so maybe five, ten percent of the entities are, are linked. Also in an enterprise, as I said, of those 3,000 IT systems, maybe only 300 are actually connected. So there are 2,700 which don't share any links and are not integrated. And linking is one approach uh, to establish links between data and connect and integrate data. What you see here is um, user interface for lines, a tool uh, which my colleague Axel Gonga uh, developed. Um, and the idea is there uh, to define the source and the target knowledge base uh, to define certain constraints, what you would like to, to link, for example, concepts, uh, and here in that case, uh, conditions. Uh, so this is bio, RDF, it's a use case from the life sciences. Uh, and then you define a metric, in that case your Lebenstein on the title of the entities you find and then you can combine that with different other metrics and measures, define thresholds, say what kind of links should be established, in that case all the same as links between the entities, and then you can run lines and it basically will compute all these links. How does Lines do that? Uh, it uses the 
um, relatedness of entities um, uh, uses characteristics of metric spaces, in particular the triangle inequality. And using this triangle inequality, we can basically approximate the distances or have a pe pessimistic approximation of the distances between um, um, items in different in the different knowledge bases. So, and that way we can approximate the distance between x and z uh, if we know the distance between x and y and between y and z. Yeah. So, and then we can rule out based on this approximation many comparisons, and we don't have to compare many instances with each other, uh, which is very important. If you look, for example, DBP, there we have. 3.5 million entities in open street maps. I think we have even several billions in linked geodata. Uh, if we wanted to compare everything with everything, this would be enormous uh, performance or, or resources which would be required. It would take years to perform all these comparisons. For example, you want to find out uh, St. Petersburg uh, in Wikipedia and link that to uh, linked geodata. There are several St. Petersburgs in the world. There is another famous one in Florida, right? So finding out which ones to link to each other require, uh, makes you uh, doing quite a lot of comparisons. You have to compare the name, but you also have to compare longitude and latitude and find out whether they are actually in the same region, for example. And only if the DBpedia uh, St. Petersburg is in the same region as the OpenStreetMaps link geodata one, then you can really say they are probably the same ones. Otherwise, you might link the St. Petersburg and DBpedia, which is the one here, with the one in Florida, right? And then people would be upset if they fly to the wrong place in the, in the world. So, um, these comparisons, they are quite time consuming. You can imagine if you have thousand instances, uh, then you have on both knowledge base, you have to do a million comparisons. If you have one million, uh, then you have to do a million times a million comparisons. So that's why we need something like this, where we can rule out a large part of those comparisons. And that's what's shown here. Um, basically, uh, it depends on those exemplars. You, have, of course, have these anchor points where you compute uh, the distances, and then you use that for approximating. Uh, the distances of the other uh, instances and um, that depends on the number of instances. For example, here uh, we have between uh, 50 and 300 exemplars tested and we also use different of those um, uh, thresholds and it turns out that um, for something like between 50 and 100 exemplars and um, threshold of 0.95 you need the least comparisons. And you can dramatically reduce the number of comparisons required by several orders of magnitude. <coughs> and then instead of years, you only need a few hours maybe to compute links between two large data sets. So this is uh, LIMES. Uh, the problem is still you have to uh, create this kind of uh, metric, linking metric. And that's pretty difficult and time consuming. And we want to simplify that. What we actually want in the future is that the user just gives examples of links. He says, this St. Petersburg should be linked to that one, and this Berlin should be linked to that one. And based on these examples, a machine learning algorithm learns basically those specifications here. Because for many users, even filling out such a form with these kind of metrics, a very small percentage of people only knows what Levenstein, for example, is, or how to compute uh, the uh, proximity using longitude and latitude, that's already quite high. Probably for you it's not such a big challenge, but for ordinary, simple or, or ordinary users that would be uh, still relatively difficult. And that's why we are working on simplifying that and using machine learning that you can learn uh, these link specifications. I think I'm um, probably running out of time. I have some other interesting things, so maybe um, I skip this part, the formalization part, just want to show you how this works. Um, the active learning of link specifications, so we come up with an initial classifier, for example, in the St. Petersburg case, it could be just comparing the names of, uh, of the cities, right? Taking St. Petersburg and uh, the other St. Petersburg. We would uh, have some kind of classifier, um, and um, then we could basically select uh, most informative 
uh, each of those points basically represents um, either a mapping or, or a link between two instances or not a link. So all uh, these here, for example, are not linked and those on the right, they are linked to each other. And then we could select in the uh, surrounding of our classifier examples and could ask the user about it. And for example, we could show him the St. Petersburg in Florida together with the St. Petersburg in Russia here and ask him, are these the same? For example, could be this question here. If the user says, no, they are not the same, um, then we can basically update um, that um, and compute a new classifier which would draw the line between <coughs> two entities uh, differently and, uh, and come a little bit closer um, to precise results. And then we continue like that. We uh, again, again we identify informative um, uh, questions which we ask the user, we get response from, from the user and thus we can improve basically the precision um, of the linking step by step by asking the user some questions. And it showed that for relatively large data sets like DBpedia and DCSA, um, we could show that 10 to 20 examples already um, uh, render an F score more than 95%. And each of those steps, computing examples for the user, uses less than one second. So uh, that makes it then relatively easy. Uh, for learning these kind of link specifications, so getting the user involved by asking him questions, he gives examples of links, positive and negative examples, and based on these positive and negative examples, we can apply some of these machine learning techniques and then learn a classifier, and the classifier basically is a link specification which then can be used to compute a large number of links between two data sets. Okay, then um, we have enrichment of knowledge bases, which is also a very important topic um, because um, lots of the information on the data web is raw data and we actually want to also have upper level structures like ontologies. Uh, that's why we need to enrich that. Uh, what you see on the picture is uranium enrichment. Um, not in Russia, not in Iran. This is Los Alamos. Uh, that's a picture I found uh, on, on Google Image Search. Uh, of course, we mean enrichment of, of data. And we have a lot of raw data, and I think that's also a quite interesting area to work on. Um, I just want to point you to this project, ORI, Ontology, Repair and Enrichment, what my uh, colleague Jens Lehmann is working on, uh, which also uses these machine learning techniques, uh, positive and negative examples, to learn ontology axioms, for example. So you can give it examples like um, uh, Moscow, Berlin, and Paris, and um, uh, the ORI tool would come up with a definition of those three, which would be capitals, right? All three are capitals. If you give it a negative example, Washington, it would come up with capitals in Europe. So it can basically learn definitions or axioms from example data. That's uh, what this ORI tool is about, and uh, this way you can add some upper level structure to your raw data. Another important aspect is quality analysis because, of course, the quality on the web is varying a lot. Um, we have some data sets which have very high quality, also many which have relatively low quality, and assessing the quality is a very important um, challenge. And it's more assessing the quality for a particular use case. For some use cases, the quality might be sufficient. For other use cases, um, it's not uh, sufficient. For example, yeah, I could not recommend for medical applications, but if it's for an entertainment application, I think the quality of the PDF is completely sufficient. So and I want to show you maybe briefly a taxonomy we are recently in the works of creating, which um, defines different quality assessment dimensions, uh, how you can assess the quality of a data set, and there we have contextual dimensions, we have intrinsic dimensions, and also with regard to accessibility, that's something related to the web of data. Are those identifiers really de-referenceable, for example? Are they, uh, what is the response time? Um, so these are important aspects of the data web as well. Um, and then you have coherence, for example, how many links you have between data items. And this you can use as an input. If you have lots of links, 
Um, maybe this can be an indicator for better quality. Actually, it's the case that in the life sciences, the data sets are very well connected and the quality there is much better than in other areas. And so, there are a large number of different uh, dimensions, quality dimensions, which can be used to get some glimpse or some idea of what the quality of the data set might be if you analyze the data set according to these different dimensions. But doing that, this analysis is actually still how to do that automatically, how to have high performance uh, metrics for these dimensions, that's still something that, uh, also like a research challenge and uh, not yet completely solved. Another important aspect is evolution, supporting the evolution of data. Um, but maybe I, I skip this quickly because um, we are almost out of time. And I would like to show you some examples how we can explore the data. So this is Luna Fort Adin, the first moon rover um, developed by the Soviet Union. I'm not showing this here, and I'm showing this always when I talk about the data web. So not uh, related to being in St. Petersburg, because I think that we are currently in a similar stage as uh, when um, we explored the moon, uh, the same stage when we got about the data web. We have lots of data out there, but it's still relatively difficult to really look at the data to build applications on top of that, so we have to do a lot of more effort to uh, make this easily explorable by end users. Um, and one idea uh, we have there is uh, to analyze data sets and to select suitable visualization widgets for the data sets based on this analysis. So uh, visualization widget could be, for example, spatial faceted browsing or statistical visualization. If you find out that the data set contains longitude and latitude, you know this is probably spatial data and you could use, for example, a spatial browser to visualize this data set. Um, something for analyzing this is LotStats, what we developed. Um, it's an approach, high performance um, analytics um, tool for analyzing data sets with regard to availability, size, interlinking, vocabulary use, and, and so on and so forth. And um, it basically downloads uh, lots of data sets which are available and parses, analyzes them and uh, makes those results available at this web page or also via Sparkle endpoint and void description files which you can access and then use that as input for example to create visualizations and one example I want to show you here is um, a spatial faceted browser where you basically have a map and then you can select different facets on the map to see the instances for example, you are interested in restaurants of a certain cuisine, you are interested in Armenian cuisine, then you can uh, select that here in the ontology or in this uh, taxonomy and then uh, you will see all the restaurants according to this cuisine, but it also works. We use OpenStreetMaps here as data, so you can also see historic fountains or other uh, types of data and explore uh, a data set this way. Okay, now I have some use cases. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Seven? Um, so I think one important use case is open government data for this linked data web um, because it helps us uh, or their governments are producing a lot of data and um, it would make a lot of sense if they give this back to citizens if they try to close uh, or get closer with citizens. It's a big topic currently in Germany. We have a party coming up which will probably be elected uh, next year to the Bundestag, to the parliament. It's a pirate party and one of their main ideas is to have more transparency and that government is more accountable, more transparent and they push a lot for this and actually the other parties now uh, after they saw the success in Berlin they got 15% or something uh, already, so in Berlin they are already in the city parliament and they are very influential. Um, after that, all the other established parties now also look into this and um, try to do a lot of things into how this data can be used and can be exploited so that you don't have, um, or that you a little bit involve uh, citizens and the public better in the political discourse or also create beneficial applications because I think with the wealth of data governments create also for example public transportation, um, many different energy consumption 
there are so many things you can do with it, um, what would be very difficult for governments alone. So this can bring a lot of benefit also for companies. One idea is that companies can actually use this data which is produced by governments in order to offer new products and services. Uh, it's not meant personal information. I don't want to publish any personal information about individuals, but more information which is non-personal, like for example public transportation, when buses or trams or trains run, right, that's something uh, which has no personal dimension, but which would be very valuable actually to a lot of users and people could build a smartphone app in order to uh, find out better how could I get from A to B. And there are actually those apps already developed, like in Germany there's one app, Öffi, it's extremely popular and it uh, provides you information how you can go from A to B using such um, data sources which are unfortunately not yet publicly available. So that's something which we want to increase and what uh, I think also some politicians in Germany it's a very difficult topic because German politicians or Germans in general are very obsessed with security, data security, data privacy. So when I talk to them and tell them you should open data, they're always scared, oh, that might be a security problem if we reveal personal information. So uh, that's in Germany a very difficult topic, but it slowly changes as well. In other countries, for example, in the UK, they are much more um, advanced in that regard. Also because Tim Berners-Lee is the advisor of the British government. Maybe I've seen the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Tim Berners-Lee was there as well. And uh, so in the UK they are much more innovative in that regard. Also the European Commission is quite pushing uh, towards that. There is the Commissioner Nelly Kroos uh, in Brussels who is uh, supporting open data a lot and they hope that this will create also a lot of jobs which is one of the main um, um, ideas or, or um, rationales of the European Commission currently in the situation of the economic crisis. So I want to show you an example, that's Public Data EU, which we developed in the LOD2 project, uh, which connects or aggregates information from 25 national and regional data catalogs. So one, for example, in Berlin, they have meanwhile also a data catalog, it's uh, data.berlin.de, so there you have hundreds of data sets about um, things in Berlin, and then they are aggregated and you can search them and uh, browse them on Public Data EU on this website, not only from Berlin, but as I said, from 30 other national data catalogs. So you have this entry point, single entry point for data sets and um, public data from, from the European uh, Union. We also recently, in the project, we have a Serbian partner from Belgrade, and they launched a Serbian data catalog. And this is actually the best one because um, all data sets are available in RDF there, so that's really great. And you can see it, um, it's also available in um, uh, Kyrillic. Uh, the the CCAT data catalog, uh, I unfortunately I could not find the Russian version. There are lots of these data catalogs in different countries. and. Uh, it doesn't have to be the government, everybody, uh, actually everybody can open a data catalog and uh, make this available. Uh, so it would be interesting to also have a, a Russian data catalog. Maybe there is already one, but it was not available via uh, the CCAN website. So CCAN is this uh, software which supports uh, running these data catalogs. It's an open source software which is developed by the Open Knowledge Foundation. Another example of what I show you here is OntoWiki, um, what I showed you previously already in the Daimler use case, where we loaded the financial transparency data. Of course, the European Commission is also concerned uh, about abuse of subventions, about corruption. So what they do in order to fight that, they publish a data set with all grants and all, uh, all basically uh, money they cash out to uh, organizations or individuals you can download it. It's a large XML dump, 200 megabytes of XML, um, which is very difficult, of course, if you're a journalist, it takes you maybe several weeks in order to find, uh, go through this data set and look at the data in order to find out something. So what we did here, we transformed that into RDF and published that on OntoWiki, and then you can basically browse the data, explore this data set, uh, jump from the, between the links and, and um, find out or maybe uh, about the beneficiaries who got some 
some grants and subventions from the European Commission. And if you have additional local knowledge, maybe you can find out whether they really did what they promised for, can identify problems uh, with regard to this um, process of, of um, um, uh, spending money. And, um, that's, I think, also a very interesting aspect where you basically can involve uh, the society, the public, in, in looking better the money, the taxpayers' money was really used according uh, in the taxpayer's interest, which is not always the case, unfortunately. So, um, and the European Commission also officially uh, wants to support that. So, um, what I just showed you before were um, individual, um, uh, basically projects. This is something which has nothing, nobody seen before you yet, because it's not yet officially launched. This is the new data portal, the official data portal from the European Commission. And uh, it also uses CCAN under the hood, so the Software uh, Comprehensive Knowledge Archiving Network, which is developed by the Open Knowledge Foundation, is used here. And then you can basically find data sets. You have different publishers, of course. The European Commission has different agencies and different branches, uh, which serve as publishers. And you see recent updates. Um, you can search at the portal. You have different categories or keywords associated with the data sets. Uh, you can look at an individual data set and get different kind of formats or the data set in different formats. And what we develop is different visualizations. So the spatial faceted browser, for example, um, we deployed there, which allows you to browse spatial data sets. Another one is statistical data. That's what you see here. Um, once there's Eurostat, the statistical agency of the European uh, Commission, and when they publish a new data set which um, uses the data cube vocabulary, you can immediately browse that um, in this um, uh, data cube browser. You can uh, select different kind of diagram types, uh, different indicators or different slices of the data that visualize it in different ways. So they don't have to spend money on visualizing the data when they produce a new data set. They can use it out of the box. They don't have to spend additional money all the time. And here's a screenshot of the spatial browser. Um, it's also, the, I think, this uh, financial transparency data set where you basically can look uh, who got uh, funding from the European Commission in a certain region. And you can look at those individual um, entities then. Okay, I have, uh, have prepared another use case, but maybe I skipped that uh, at that point. I think we are out of time already. And I would also like to give you the opportunity to ask some questions you might have. So, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And um, I will be also here the next um, three days. So, if you have any uh, suggestions, ideas, comments, um, then um, I'm very happy to discuss that with you as well. Thank you. Okay, I have a first question for you. What do you think about provenance? Oh, uh, yeah, I think provenance is a very important topic, that, uh, especially for the quality aspect, that you basically can trace where information was generated, where it was, uh, who created that. Uh, so I think this is uh, very important. Unfortunately, it probably won't be possible to to have a complete lineage of provenance. I think even on the document web, we also don't have that. But what's quite nice about linked data is that you have this provenance information already built into the identifiers, because each identifier carries uh, the domain name um, and the URL, basically. Those URIs have the domain name. You can retrieve it. You can basically check whether it was really published by this publisher. You can verify who published that, at least from what domain name, and then you can say I trust everybody who comes from an academic domain, for example, or from this and that domain, this information. So, um, but there is also a W3C working group. I don't know if you were referring to that, <laughs> which tries to push a little bit more for uh, attaching provenance information to IDF data. My second question. Um, is this now the third time that we run the Knowledge Engineering Semantic Web Challenge here? So, what do you see as the big key challenges where Russian universities or the research community can help to improve the 
linked data. Yeah, I think there are many opportunities, especially because um, uh, since uh, Rush, Russian uh, has a different script, Kyrillic, right? Most of the tools which are developed, they might work well with Latin, but maybe uh, they have some issues with Kyrillic. We actually uh, had this problems that you um, in DBP yeah, with the multi there there's multilingual versions of DBP, there is also Russian versions, so we found out that there are lots of troubles and problems actually, so that's one thing, basically checking whether the things which were developed elsewhere work also well with, um, with a different script maybe, but of course also I think Russia developed a lot of approaches, uh, theoretical approaches for um, text mining, classification, uh, different other fields of science which could be very useful I think on the linked data web so making them available um, and, and useful for, for other researchers in other areas I think that would be very very beneficial and I think in computer science uh, the paradigm or the way how to do that is usually producing some kind of open source software or some software uh, which that's what we do in my research group we try to uh, publish all the software we, uh, we create as open source so other researchers can basically use that, improve that, contribute to that or use that in their own tools and that can maybe facilitate some kind of larger collaboration between research groups in different areas. It doesn't always have to be or open source, of course sometimes you also want to commercialize something but I actually think that it doesn't contradict itself even for example the Daimler use case I presented um, companies, big companies, they don't want to use open source or they want to have somebody they can make responsible and reliable so they actually want to pay something and they don't care whether it costs uh, 20,000 euro or 50,000 a year if they have somebody who is reliable and who is responsive when they have a problem so that's why having something available as open source and at the same time also offering maybe commercial services on top of it together with companies I think is a very viable strategy. So, any questions from the audience? One or two? No. Ah. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> yeah, not much voice today. Um, yeah, the question about the, the Daimler scenario with the enterprise integration. Uh, because uh, uh, <coughs> I, I guess you are, I'm getting old and, and cynical, but the, of course the enterprise integration has been a scenario where so many approaches have come and gone and not really dealt with the uh, uh, problem. Uh, I don't know what's all the, <coughs> the data. Database community yeah. uh, of the, the, the rapper stuff. Uh, and then about uh, 10 years ago, ontologies arrived, and uh, a lot of people wrote a lot of papers about how ontologies were going to solve all these problems in the same year. And, um, and now the link data are going to solve all these problems, actually, it's, 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 it's. Um, So, you know, to put it in a negative way, I basically don't see anything in the link data as a technology. It's actually significantly can really make anything particularly different from what the approach has been tried before, especially when you talk about the of use. Um, more constructively, I would say, it is, uh, um, are there specific, so, you know, specifically, let's say, um, augmentation to the typical uh, uh, lean data technologies, in particular, at the level of representation that you guys are thinking uh, about in order to address these, uh, you know, slightly more complicated than the integration to get these levels. Yeah, first, I completely agree that integrating um, a large number of information sources in the enterprise is really the holy grail of data integration, and we will probably never have the ultimate solution to that. It will always be moving towards this holy grail and never reaching it. Um, that's why I, I also agree there were like, uh, for example, service-oriented architectures which make quite an impact uh, and never reach this goal. I still think that the data can contribute a lot to that and can help uh, um, integrating information better in, in enterprises. And sometimes it's not associated with fundamental new concepts, but with relatively small uh, small things. For example, one small thing is to have this unique identifiers, URIs, right? If 
if I talk to a database person on front, they always say, yeah, we do that for 30 years, but they don't have, in their database, you don't have unique identifiers for a data item in the database. And having a unique identifier, which you actually can retrieve and check whether the data is still there and it's still the same and who has published it, uh, that's something which is extremely valuable to large enterprises. So having a URI for a certain data item and then you already know where it's located, where it came from, you can check whether it's still there or whether it has changed. And I think this is, a, from a research perspective, it's almost nothing, right? But from the, the, from the company perspective, that's something extremely valuable for them uh, when they have really your eyes for all these different data items and they don't have this currently. Uh, so equipping all these 3,000 um, databases and information systems with your eyes for the data items they host, uh, that would be an extremely big benefit for them and uh, extremely big step forward already to identify uh, the different sources of information and the pieces of information because that's what they currently cannot do. So they have problems identifying locations or parts and uh, each different department has different identifiers. Of course they will still, even with URIs, they will have different URIs, but they can maybe establish links between them and they have a, a unified scheme for establishing the links. Right now they maybe also do that, but they have Excel sheets or different kind of uh, tables uh, or, or lots of different variants. There is no homogeneous way and I think the W3C spends so much time in, in standardizing all these technologies, RDF, RDF schema, OWL and certain properties and OWL like all same as, which potentially was cost taxonomy uh, vocabulary. So this can be very well applied. I think and there's a huge potential for applying it. But I completely agree. It's maybe not so much something new from the research perspective, and we will probably also not solve this problem ultimately, but just make maybe one or two more steps uh, towards the CDP.